So good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs, for five more weeks anyway. <laughs> Victorian historian Thomas Carlyle is credited with saying economics, he called economics the dismal science. But to John Tamney, if I read him correctly, the only thing that is truly dismal about economics are the politicians and the legions of government lawyers, regulators, and assorted bureaucrats that don't know how to leave well enough alone. In his new book, Popular Economics, What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James Can Teach You About Economics, John takes us through the basics to demonstrate fairly convincingly that popular culture offers all sorts of lessons that we ignore at our peril. There is much in this book that is worth pondering, indeed savoring. One of my favorite parts is when John uses some examples of egregious errors by entertainment industry executives to demonstrate how federal antitrust lawyers cannot possibly be clairvoyant, and thus should not be empowered to make decisions about breaking up successful businesses or forcing merged companies to shed successful business lines. To buttress this argument, John points out, MGM decided to take a pass on the chance to produce Gone with the Wind. CBS television rejected the opportunity to telecast Monday Night Football. The three major broadcast networks turned down a proposal for a series called The Sopranos. How does this relate to antitrust? As John puts it, if Irving Thalberg, he was the guy in charge of NGM, if Irving Thalberg could not see the potential of Gone with the Wind, if William Paley, he was the CBS guy, dismissed Monday Night Football, who really thinks that government lawyers can tell which businesses will possess too much power down the line. Popular economics is full of examples like these. John uses the sad story of movie director Peter Bogdanovich spending his way to the poorhouse to illustrate the fallacy that consumer spending is the cause of economic growth. He even intimates that the performance of Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke in the Great Recession suggests that this reputed scholar of the Great Depression maybe resembles what Talleyrand said about the Bourbons, learned nothing and forgot everything. <laughs> I dare say you will learn a lot from listening to John Tamney tonight, and you will not be the first to figure this out. John is one of the most prolific journalists around, and he has quite a following. He's the political economy editor at Forbes, He's the editor of Real Clear Markets. And he's also a senior economic advisor to Toreador Research and Trading. Popular Economics is available for sale, thanks to our friends at Barnes & Noble. John will be signing copies following his presentation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Tamney. Does Willie have me hot? I think he does by now. Um, wow, Henry, that's, I, I kind of want to hear your presentation of my book more than I want to give mine. <laughs> Thank you very much for a generous introduction. And let me begin by saying how thoroughly flattered and excited I am to be here tonight. Uh, obviously, some very big names have been here before, including David McCullough. I guess I'm kind of a disappointment, the uh, pinch hit minor leaguer coming in. but. Uh, it's a big deal to get to do this, and I hope you know how grateful I am. And so I want to, first of all, thank, he's not here tonight, but Bruce Brannion for uh, making the initial introduction to uh, Crosby Kemper about me. He's uh, extolled my virtues for quite some time. Obviously, Dane Stangler and the people at, uh, at, the, at the Kauffman Foundation. 
did a lot to make this happen. Um, thanks to everyone at, at the Kansas City Public Library. It's such a beautiful setting. I wish I had more time here, but uh, Amber Caldwell went to a lot of work to make this happen. So did Courtney Lewis. Uh, Henry had to suffer numerous phone calls with me. And uh, I'm sad to hear that Henry's going, but I can't wait to see what he does next. He's got some really fun ideas ahead. So that's, that's on its own, very exciting. And thanks, of course, to all of you for taking the time to come out. It, it really means a lot to me, and I hope to vindicate your choice by offering up a, a different point of view on what's going on in the world and how we should look at the world. Now, I guess the way I'd like to begin is I want to talk about sentiment that I sense in the United States. I email a lot with my readers. They, they're constantly sending me ideas. I'm a better writer because I've got such interesting readers. And there's a lot of negativity out there. There's, there's this view, broad view out there that somehow we've crossed the line. We've become addicted to the state, and we cannot recover from the mistakes we've made in modern times. I reject that point of view, and I reject it strongly. Uh, we've come back from much worse, much, much worse than what we're in the midst of right now. And I, and I think it should be the source of optimism. One of the lines in my book is that Americans haven't run out of ideas or energy or initiative what they suffer right now are government barriers to their natural desire to produce. And so I want to go back briefly to the 1970s. I don't think I'm offending anyone by saying that many of you remember the 70s quite well. <laughs> <laughs> but you look back to that period, and a Gallup poll of Americans in 1979, 84% uh, America, said America was on the wrong track. And it truly was. You look back to dollar policy back then, the dollar was truly in free fall. Um, it had lost enormous amounts of value and it had choked off investment in the ideas and companies of the future. You look at something as basic as communication, there were no mobile phones back in the 1970s. And so if you wanted to communicate, it was via landline. But if you wanted to own a landline, it was in fact illegal to own one. You had to lease it from the government's preferred monopoly. In terms of air travel, air travel was planned by what was called the Civil Aeronautics Board. They parceled out routes to different um, airlines. They controlled it, and that's why it was very, very expensive. Most people couldn't fly in the 1970s. I grew up in Southern California, and thanks to the weak dollar, gasoline surged in price back in the 1970s. There's this myth about Arab oil shocks that is, is belied by basic, the basic truth about money. With the dollar in decline, gasoline became very expensive. But politicians in their infinite wisdom didn't realize that it was their mistakes. They instead instituted price controls on gasoline. So in the late 70s, we literally were given a choice if you had odd or even on the end of your license plate, that was the day you were allowed to go buy gasoline so you could wait in Soviet-style lines, hoping that there would be gasoline once you got to the front of it. Considering taxation, the top tax rate in the 1970s was 70%. And there was consensus on both sides that we, that we couldn't lower that rate. Here's what Alan Greenspan said about Arthur Laffer and his views on cutting taxes. I don't know anyone who seriously believes his argument. Jimmy Carter on the left made the same argument, that we just could not cut taxes. It would be bad for the economy if the government penalized work less. And so I bring all of this up to remind us that we have every reason to be optimistic. We came back from much worse in the 1970s, and I think that's important to realize, and, and that's the, the basis of my book that we're in another period of negativity, and I make the argument that economic growth is easy. With economics, there are easy answers, truly easy answers. I see red when politicians and economists talk about the new normal, about how we're just going to have to accept a low economic growth going into the future. The same was said in the 1970s, and it was not true. And it wasn't true because all economic growth is, is removing four basic barriers to the natural desire of individuals to produce. Humans are the biggest dr drivers of production, and we've got the best humans in the world in the United States. And that's not some jingoistic comment, that's just fact. We, because we're a nation of people from everywhere, have skimmed the best off the top for generations. When you think about what that says about the United States, 
We have attracted the people who would be willing to leave everything, a language they understand, family and friends they know, to come to utter confusion in a new country where odds are they don't know the language and where they were going to be met by major poverty upon arrival, but they came here anyway. So we're naturally an entrepreneurial, kind of restless nation. After that, there are four basics to economic growth that if you get them right, you always have booming prosperity. And in my book, of course, I talk about them, as Henry alluded, through sports and, and entertainment and famous businesses. Economics is easy, and I find it offensive that the political class and, and economists have made it difficult. Well, so the first basic is taxation. Let's be clear about what it is. Taxes are a price. They're just a penalty placed on work. So in an ideal world, you want the top tax rate to be very low. You want to encourage people to produce as much as possible. Fairly simple. Considering capital gains taxes, you'll hear this a lot tonight, but there are no companies and no jobs without investment first. And so in an ideal world, you'd want the capital gains tax to be zero. Why would you want to penalize people saving and investing? It's fairly simple. The third basic tax, which economists really struggle with, is government spending, but it's by definition a tax. Uh, 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 and to put it very plainly, governments have no resources. That's not some libertarian slogan meant to please people like me in the audience. That's just fact. Governments can only spend what they've taxed or borrowed from the private sector first. And so when governments spend with abandon, it's basically uh, the, the, the private economy providing resources to Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner to redistribute. It's no wonder that, that it it's a wet blanket on economic growth. The second basic is regulation. Let's be blunt, regulation does not work. It cannot work. If you doubt me, all you need to do is go back to 2008. The banking sector in the US was easily the most regulated sector in the US, if not the world, and those charged with overseeing the banks didn't have a clue about the problems within, within them. Now the obvious problem with regulation is while it cannot work, it forces businesses to spend enormous amounts of time uh, uh, pleasing regulators and, and following rules rather than creating new, new innovations and new profits for shareholders. To believe that regulation works is to believe that those who could not get jobs in medicine, pharmaceuticals, finance, can somehow oversee those who could, and better yet, can somehow see into the future of commerce in ways that those in the actual business world would never presume to see. It cannot work, it's a failed idea. The third basic is money. Let's be clear about what this is. Money is not wealth. If you take this to a deserted island, it will get you nothing. Money is a measure. It's what we use to measure wealth, the actual wealth we produce, so we can get something else in return. I've got bread, I want your wine. We use money to measure the value of the bread so we can get a commensurate amount of wine. The way to look at this is to think about what life would be like for a chef or a construction worker if the length of the minute, teaspoon and foot, changed all the time. If so, there'd be chaos in the kitchen and a lot of inedible food would emerge from it. In terms of construction, there would be leaning towers of Pisa around the world. Adam Smith got it right back in the, in the 18th century. The sole purpose of money is to facilitate the exchange of consumable goods. And then I would add on to that to facilitate investment in the creation of wealth in the, in the future. And so the only good money is money that's stable in value. And so when it's floating around, it's robbed of its singular purpose. And then the fourth basic, and I leave it for last because it's the simplest of them, but it's widely misunderstood by economists and politicians, is trade. As individuals, we're all free traders. From looking at all of us in the audience, it's apparent, and this is a compliment, that none of us probably cut our own hair, those of us who have it. None of us make the clothes that we wear. None of us raise the food that we eat. Most of us don't build the houses and apartments we live in. We trade with others. We trade the fruits of our labors with others. And so when you think about free trade, it's this beautiful process whereby you don't just have your neighbors and people in your state or your country vying to serve your needs. You have the most talented people on earth vying to serve you, getting in line to give you a bargain. But even that doesn't describe the, the, the full wonders of free trade. What makes it truly beautiful is that it maximizes the possibility that we individuals will get to do the work that most animates our individual talents. If you can leave all the other things that you're not as good at to others, that leaves you time to specialize. And what happens when you get to specialize? What happens when you get to do something that you love? It's suddenly not work. 
Instead, it's pleasure, it's excitement. And when you're doing something you love and specialize in, you're much more productive. There's a reason that free trading nations tend to be rich because they tend to be full, full, full of people doing what they do best. And so that's what's exciting about the times in which we live, and that's what makes me optimistic. Okay, so we're going through relatively slow economic times right now. Well, that's simple. You want to fix this, just remove the barriers to the natural genius of the individual, of the human being. And that's the basis, of course, of my talk tonight. There are so many themes in my books, but those, I've described the underlying theme. Within it, I talk about inequality. Because as is well known, not just in Europe, but in the United States, inequality is presently under attack. It's said by many deep thinkers that inequality is a bad thing. Economists and politicians say that inequality harms an economy, that it weakens society. I'm here tonight to defend it. I think we should all defend it. And the way that I'm going to talk about it is I'm going to begin with a quote from Henry Hazlitt's essential book, Economics in One Lesson. Now, in it, he wrote, what is harmful or disastrous to an individual must be equally harmful or disastrous to the collection of individuals that make up a nation. Now think about that for a second. I would argue that that's the, one of the most powerful statements ever made in any book in, in the history of, 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 of economics. And other than that book out there, which you really should buy, it's the next <laughs> book you should buy. But what is harmful or disastrous to an individual must be equally harmful or disastrous to the collection of individuals that make up a nation. Hazlitt said something so basic, but totally misunderstood by the political class, whether Republican or Democrat, and misunderstood by most economists. If they understood it, we would be experiencing prosperity today that would make the present look microscopic by comparison. Hazlitt was saying that economies aren't blobs, they're just a collection of individuals. And so when you break it down to an individual, you can then see why taxes are such a burden on the economy when they're high. Because how is an individual helped by excessive taxation? How is an individual helped by government taking the vast majority of his or her earnings and spending it? How is an individual helped by rules that make it difficult to operate the business? How is an individual helped when the money he uses to transact um, is floating around in value? How is an individual helped if he can't exchange the fruits of his labor with anyone irrespective of country. You can then see why the four basics are so simple. But let's apply it to inequality and let's ask a basic question. Are you worse off when you get to pursue the very things that most animate your individual talents? Are you worse off as individuals when you get to do that which makes you most unequal relative to others? Conversely, are you better off if you're forced into work that doesn't showcase your talents, that you're really bad at. So you think about it in those terms, there are debate stars in this room, there are people who are talented, wildly talented at mathematics, who are great at sales, who are great at running a business. Imagine if you couldn't do that which makes you great. Imagine how much worse off the economy would be if we couldn't do what animates our skills. Was Kansas City made worse off because George Brett could hit a baseball better than just about anyone in the history of the world. Was Major League Baseball made worse? Is, is Kansas City worse off because Jamal Charles is one of the most beautiful runners that at least I've ever seen? Is society worse off because Jeff Bezos has figured out a way for Americans in the world to order the world's plenty all with a click of a mouse? I think we know the answer to it. And that's the purpose of my talk. Inequality is beautiful. Inequality is merely the signal of the very happy truth that the individuals who comprise a school, a city, a company, or a national economy are in fact getting to maximize the pursuit of what makes them most individually great. But as is well known now, inequality is under attack. Uh, we see it from all sides. It's become a pejorative. Even people who would agree with me fight inequality. They bring up Gini coefficients and everything and say, well, actually, it's not as bad. Why would, we, why would we feel the need to defend that which animates the individual? Most of you know the magazine uh, Vanity Fair and its editor, Graydon Carter. He wrote in the April issue in horror about a Wall Street Journal statistic that said that by the year 2020, 40 trillion in global wealth would be controlled by a mere 250,000 people. 
This scares Carter. And it's interesting on its face because Carter is, is the editor of one of the last great magazines on earth. By that very definition or by that very logic, Graydon Carter is one of the greatest, investor, uh, greatest editors on earth. His own inequality relative to his peers doesn't bother him, but it concerns him when others pursue that which makes them great. Now, I'm, of course, of the opinion that the inequality that scares him is, in fact, a wonderful thing, that the more there is, the more there is wealth creation, the more there's concentration of wealth, the better the odds are that you, your children, and your grandchildren will get to pursue the path in life that most animates their individual talents. And this includes if you, your children, and grandchildren want to pursue that which involves no profit. Let's face it. Where we're standing right now is a monument to inequality. It's a monument to capitalistic achievement that made this amazing building possible. It's when enterprise is rewarded that everyone gets to pursue that which they want to, the odds are great, they get to pursue that which animates their skills. And to put it very plainly, and this is what I say in the book, if you want to spread around the wealth, let the rich hold on to their wealth. It's that simple. I'm not rich. I'll make that clear in advance. If you want to let them, if you want to redistribute it, let them hold on to it. Now, what I do in my book is I bring up lots of people that to make strong statements, to basically, in many times, objectionable people to get people thinking, to kind of wake them up about the points I'm trying to make. Paris Hilton is one of my examples for inequality. Um, she is reveled by many. She's infamous, not famous. Uh, many who would agree with me that we should get rid of the estate tax say about Paris Hilton, she's an example for why it, it, should, it should exist, that with people like that who don't know what to do with their money, it's good that the government kind of relieves them of it. <laughs> I disagree. Um, think about Paris Hilton. She earns millions of dollars a year, and she has the potential to earn many, many millions more. But what that tells us is that she can't spend it all in one place. So what happens when she doesn't spend it? Let's say she's conservative with it and puts it in a bank. As Crosby Kemper could tell you, they don't take in the, the deposits of others and just stare lovingly at it and say, oh, look, those are Paris Hilton's dollars. <laughs> they pay, pay Paris Hilton for her deposits because they, want, they were going to immediately lend them out to people who need a car loan people who need tuition to send their kids to a different school, people who need money or a loan to start up a private business. What if Paris Hilton decides to be a bit more aggressive and puts it in the stock market? That means her wealth is being immediately redistributed to companies that need capital in order to grow and hire new individuals. What if she's even more aggressive and says, I'm going to put it in private equity uh, funds or venture capital funds? That means Paris Hilton's, Hilton's wealth is being redistributed to companies that are literally on the, de the proverbial deathbed, but who need a capital infusion in order to survive. That or she's redistributing her wealth to a future Googles and Microsofts and Intels. If you want to redistribute the wealth of the rich to others who aren't rich, the quickest, best, most life-affirming way to do it is to let them hold on to it. Unless they're stuffing it under a mattress, their wealth is immediately getting to all of us who are not nearly as rich as Paris Hilton, but who want to animate our own dreams. Let's think about the other option. Some probably disagree with me. Some probably are horrified by my libertarian point of view. But one, one thing I think we all agree on in this room, at least judging by polling data, is Americans cannot stand Congress. So the other option is to let Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner redistribute it to probably the politically connected, and I think most of us don't like that unless the polling data is wrong. So when you think about it in those terms, the, the story of inequality becomes, I think, a bit more appealing. Okay, let the rich hold on to their wealth. Well, let's see how this applies to the world in which we live. I, I mentioned early the 1970s and made that mean comment about how most of you can remember it. Well, think back to the 1970s. Television was an utter wasteland in the 70s. We all remember it. I do too. Three networks plus PBS, and then if you lived in a big market, a few more local stations. Televisions were box sized back then, and they called them the idiot box because there wasn't much good on to watch. It was kind of a lousy time to be a television fan. We went to movies instead. Well, in 1979, ESPN emerged. ESPN was a complete joke in the 1970s. Its sports programming was Connecticut colleges. Well, you know, think about that. 
Um, its office was the size of a living room, and the desks were plywood that they borrowed next door that they nailed to the wall. To keep it going, the son of the founder, Scott Rasmussen, emptied out his bank account of $91. Uh, that, that was just to uh, pay the incorporation fee. The founder, Bill Rasmussen, borrowed $9,000 against a Visa card uh, just to keep the company going. Enter the Getty Oil Trust. They invested $10 million in ESPN. Now, John Paul Getty, many of you remember, was the richest American in the 1950s. And in the early 70s, he died and left behind a large estate to his heirs. His heirs were looking to diversify out of oil investments, and they found ESPN. Now, the logical response would be the Gettys were so rich, $10 million is nothing to them. They could find that digging through the sofas in the mansion. But in fact, that argument proves my point. That's precisely why you want to get rid of the estate tax altogether. Because it's the excess wealth that finds its way to the truly interesting ideas. It's nothing to, to invest in McDonald's or AT&T or some prosaic, long, successful company. It's quite another to invest in an ESPN. Odds are you're going to fail. And so that's why you want to leave estates and wealth as intact as much as possible, simply because you want as much wealth in the real economy chasing kind of the, the wild ideas that would only be funded in a world in which people had lots of excess capital. If the government's taking half of estates, the ESPNs are much less likely to be funded as a rule. But if you can hold on to everything, you're going to take a risk on a few high flyers. And so you think about economic growth, McDonald's has already grown, AT&T's already grown. To get the real growth, the surprises in the economy, you need to have wealth finding the, the ideas that seem a little bit crazy, that may not make it, that odds are are not going to make it. Silicon Valley's full of them. Most businesses in Silicon Valley fail. But that's where you get the major growth from, and that's why you want to keep estates intact. So when you think about this, and you think about ESPN, now one of the most valuable properties on Earth, the story of inequality becomes even more interesting about keeping wealth in the hands of the wealthy. And then you think about what inequality does to all of us. Well, you know, guess what? We're Americans. Americans, I don't think, are generally bothered by achievement. Americans tend to admire it. We don't go to bed at night and get in the fetal position and say, oh, wow, that guy's earning more than, than I do. What we generally say is that's an inspiration. Okay, we want to be like that. As Canadian economist Reuven Brenner who grew up in the concentration camps in Europe and knows the horrors of government up close, wrote, it is the perception of inequality that induces people to take risks. That describes Americans, I think, pretty well. They see people achieve and they think, okay, I'm going to gamble on something. I want to be like that. And there are so many examples of this, but I want to read uh, a few lines from a column by, uh, by Al Newharth that he wrote a few years before he died. He wrote, I was a poor German-Russian kid from South Dakota. My dad died when I was two. This was a column he wrote about himself and Larry King, the great talk show host. Larry King grew up in Brooklyn and similarly had nothing growing up. His dad died when he was in the fifth grade. As Newharth put it, Larry and I both knew we knew we'd have to take some big risks if we wanted to make it big time. He gambled on a late night talk show that he got syndicated nationally in 1978. It ultimately developed into CNN's Larry King Live. I gambled on USA Today in 1982. It became the nation's newspaper. Now forget about what you think. Maybe you love their ideologies. Maybe you dislike their ideologies. They certainly didn't, don't agree. They didn't agree with me on much of anything. But I can't think of a more beautiful American story. Two people who came up with nothing who gambled on something to make them great, who wanted something better for themselves, and they did it. And that's what we've got to remember. When we break up estates, when government consumes the wealth created in the private sector, it's not going to change the lifestyles of the rich. They're going to be rich regardless. But what it does, when you shrink the capital base, you rob those who don't have, who have an entrepreneurial idea and, and want to animate it but need capital to do it. The simple truth is that there are no entrepreneurs without capital. When we break up estates, we're not hurting the rich. We're hurting those who want to get rich, who want to do something really special. And that's something to consider. And I think when you think about it in those terms, the story of inequality becomes a little bit more interesting. Maybe it's not so bad that we let wealth stay intact. 
And so you take it even further. What is inequality about? Why does it rise? Why, do, why is inequality always rising in the United States, a very capitalist country? That just seems so unjust. But in fact, the reason inequality is rising is the strongest signal that the lifestyle gap between the rich and poor is falling. It's shrinking. Simply put, if you want to see how the rich and poor of today will live in the future, all you need to do is look at how the rich are living today, and that will give you a pretty good idea of how we're all going to live if we let free markets work. How do people get rich in, in, in the U.S.? Look at the Forbes 400. In just about every instance, we're talking about people who took what was solely enjoyed by the rich and made it broadly available to everyone. So let's think about this. Let's think about the mobile phone. The first one was created in 1983 by Motorola. It was brick size. We remember it from the movies. It had a half hour of battery life. The reception was terrible. If you wanted to call St. Louis from Kansas City, it was going to cost you a fortune in roaming charges. To get this phone, it was going to set you back $3,995. Cell phones were the preserve of the rich. Okay, well, there are billionaires in society today, many of them, and they got rich, making it possible for anyone to have these. I was in McDonald's recently having breakfast. I watched one of the interviewees interviewing for a job just behind the counter, tapping on her phone between interviews, doing email, using the Internet. She can call anywhere in the United States on that phone, anywhere in the world, very cheaply. This is the inequality that many decry whereby entrepreneurs take what was only enjoyed by the rich and make it broadly available to everyone. What about the personal computer? The first one was created by IBM in the 1960s. It filled a room like this. It cost over a million dollars. It had very few capabilities. Michael Dell, among many others, is worth billions today precisely because he took that which only a few could access and made it so that most in this room probably have several, including one with infinitely greater capabilities that fits in their pocket, like this phone. What about John D. Rockefeller, um, arguably the, 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 the name connected to the greatest fortune in U.S. history? In the 19th century, nighttime was bleak. There wasn't much you could do. It got dark, and that was the end of the day. John D. Rockefeller's first fortune was a function of getting kerosene to people who didn't have it before. He literally lit up the night. And then he trained his genius on gasoline. That was important because realize the automobile was something that only the rich enjoyed. But Henry Ford got exceedingly wealthy, making the automobile broadly available to all Americans. It was powered by gasoline that Rockefeller refined. So you think about inequality, it doesn't cause poverty. It's not, it's, poverty isn't some sort of result of it. Inequality in, in a capitalist society is what makes poverty what reduces the sting of it, makes what the rich enjoy broadly available to everyone. Now, in my book, I use sports a lot of as an example, just because I think in Arrowhead Stadium, as in one of many examples, there are no Republicans, no Democrats, no Libertarians, no crazy anarchists like me. There are just, there are just sports fans. Well, what is the quickest way to ruin your season on an annual basis, or anyone's season? It's an athlete tearing up his knee. That's usually what does it, and then the season's over with. You hope the person can come back. Well, imagine if a doctor or scientist comes up with a way for an athlete who tears up the knee to be back on the field within a day or a week. This person probably would grow very rich in the process, but would people in this room say, oh, wait a second, let's hide that cure because we don't want inequality to grow. That's a dangerous thing for society. I don't think anyone would say that. Now, you can sit here and, and laugh and say, okay, that would never happen. They will never come up with that cure. But look at what's happened to medical care over the last 150 years thanks to the profit motive. During the Civil War, if you were shot, you were left for dead. There was nothing they could do for you, over with. If you broke your leg in the 1860s, one in three chance you were going to die. If you broke your hip, dead. Forget about it. Move on. We're leaving you. If you had cancer, dead. They had no cure. Well, there's a billionaire in Los Angeles today named Patrick Soon Chiang, and he's gotten that way by virtue of getting us closer and closer to a cancer cure. It was just announced today that in, down in Houston at the MD Anderson Center, someone's come up with a rapid new advance against pancre pa pancreatic cancer, which until recently has been a death sentence. Assuming people come up with these kinds of cures, will we say, oh, no, 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 let's actually 
keep that buried underground because, you know, someone's going to get rich in the process. No, that would enhance our lives. It'd be a wonderful thing. In a more broad sense, just ask yourself the question. Michael Dell, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, the late Steve Jobs, all of them made billions wildly enhancing our lives. Would we be happier today? Could anyone tell me we'd be happier today in this room if they'd been layabouts, if they'd been on the dole? Certainly inequality would be less, but would our lives be better if they hadn't pursued their own dream? I think not. I think the answer is fairly simple on all of these. Now, some will bring up, and it's a fair point, they'll say about inequality that sometimes people are rich not because they, they created something great, but because the government saved them. Well, I'll join you and say that the bailouts in 2008 of, of, of banks and car makers were a disaster. I was very much against them at the time. They were a disaster not just for the economy, not just for the taxpayer, but they were a disaster for cars, for car makers, and the banking system. That was not wealth creation. In fact, that was anti-wealth. There was nothing about inequality in that scenario. It was the opposite of it. And let me be clear, I love Wall Street. I think what Wall Street does is brilliant. We have Apple today, we have Dell, we have Amazon, among many others, because Wall Street finds finance for, for entrepreneurs who couldn't find it otherwise. And it's precisely because I love what Wall Street does that I loathe those bailouts. Silicon Valley is not the richest part of the United States because all of its businesses succeed. It's the richest precisely because the vast majority of its businesses fail. Through failure, you get positive evolution. Entrepreneurs le learn what not to do in the future. Bad business concepts are starved so that good ones can receive it in abundance. Wall Street wasn't strengthened by those bailouts. Wall Street now is wholly owned by the federal government. It's admitted, the CEO of Morgan Stanley admitted, that its number one client today is the federal government. That wasn't good for anyone. That was a disaster for all concerned. Rather than finding a way to get capital to the, to the Amazons of the future, investment banks today are serving political masters, Republican and Democrat. That was not an, an example of inequality. That was an example of the taxpayers being fleeced to harm the financial sector and the economy overall and harm future growth. We're talking about something different when we talk about inequality. I want bonuses on Wall Street to be high, but I want Wall Street to fail when it fails. When businesses get in, when banks get in trouble, they should be allowed to go under like anyone else. When we're talking about inequality, we're talking about individuals pursuing something that animates their individual talents and that invariably makes us all better off too. So I think probably from hearing me, all of you probably realize the, where I stand on this. I think, I think wealth creation is a beautiful thing. I think it's essential. I don't want to live in a country that would fight inequality, that wants to make us all equal. A country like that would be marked by unrelenting drudgery, and it would be worst of all for the poorest among us. It's a society like this that makes us better off. But I want to end with, with a story of, of a business and a brand that we all know. From 1981 to 1997, Roberto Goizueta ran Coca-Cola in the words of the Wall Street Journal while focusing strictly on business. If they had made a movie about Goizueta, they would have said that he was, he, he was one of those cranky CEOs. All he cared about was the shareholder. Businesses weren't a social concept. They weren't about charity. His job, as he felt it, was to make money for his shareholders. That was the only thing. Thank goodness for Roberto Goizueta. Indeed, his focus on profits utterly transformed Atlanta. Thanks to the stupendous rise in the value of Coca-Cola shares while he ran the company, Emory University has now has one of the largest endowments on earth, such that it can provide scholarships to some of the neediest people in the United States. The Robert Woodruff Foundation, the Woodruffs were the original founders of Coke, gives out hundreds of millions of dollars a year to Atlanta charities, and it funds the, 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 the planting of trees all over Atlanta that beautifies the city. Maybe most exciting of all is the story of a pediatrician named Bill Warren. With his earnings from his private practice, he kept buying Coca-Cola shares, you know, kind of a boring, prosaic concept. He made so much money from those shares that he was able to shut down his practice and devote his life to helping inner-city Atlanta families with their, with their health struggles. Now, Coke's rising profits and share price once again made all this possible. While Coke was worth $4 billion when Goizueta took over in 1981, 
It was valued at $145 billion when he died of cancer in 1997. Goy's weight had died almost a billionaire. His great wealth surely increased inequality. But can anyone seriously say that Atlanta, the U.S., or the world were made worse off as a result of what Goy's weight had did? He's a reminder that inequality isn't just good, but that it makes it possible for people to do good in ways that don't always involve profits. To be very clear, inequality is wildly compassionate. You do not want to live in a society that doesn't elevate achievement. Yet to me, that almost misses the point. What's most great about inequality to me is that it signals freedom. It signals the right of all individuals to pursue that which m most animates their individual talents. So to me, inequality signals happiness. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Here we go. Um, I think that you made a lot of good points. However, based upon what you're saying, then am I correct in assuming that you feel that Brownback's current fiscal policy is um, something good and, and that will um, bring to fruition positive things? I mean, I know that everybody's following what's happening in Kansas because you can't help it. But based upon what you're saying, you know, um, do you feel that you support the direction he's going? Um, I want to point out first, uh, yeah, no, of course, yeah, uh, I'll repeat all the questions. I want to point out first of all that it was said, I agreed with a lot that what, what you said. Okay, so good, remember that. Um, but uh, the, the, question, <laughs> the, the question was, do I agree with Brownback's policies? I can't speak as knowledgeably as many. My understanding is I've had a few writers write on him is that he has tried to achieve some minor tax cuts and I believe spending cuts, um, uh, <laughs> am, I, am I right or wrong? That's correct. Oh, it is. That's right. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. So if it's massive, if it's massive, massive tax hike or cut. Okay. Well, to me, that's a good thing. Uh. Well, you know. I'm, Okay, I would prefer, okay, given the choice, I think you, you'd always prefer to tax, um, tax consumption over income. Why would we penalize work? Um, and then in terms of spending cuts, again, I want to meet these politicians who are better at allocating capital than Warren Buffett is or Jeff Bezos of Amazon or the late Steve Jobs. I don't think you can find it, and it's not because they're bad people, but if you're allocating the capital of others, there's no, there's no market discipline. If Warren Buffett were a politician, he would be a terrible investor, and he would because the simple truth that he would never have to starve his bad investments. He's a successful investor because he has to kill off his darlings. With government, programs are forever, whether they work or not. That's the equivalent of us still being on Friendster as opposed to Facebook, typing on Commodore computers as opposed to Apple. It's the equivalent of all of us driving Edsel's rather than much better Fords. With government, bad ideas are never starved. And so if you can tell me government's cutting spending, you can't, that, that, that is always and everywhere a positive for actual economic growth. You, and the oh no. <laughs> Um, okay, so the question was um, Rockefeller, Carnegie, um, uh, Getty, uh, should they have been able to go on doing as they did without uh, government restraint? Um, without question, yes. <laughs> well, uh, but, let, let's, for one, there's no such thing as a private monopoly. Now, let, let, let me be clear about this. 
I defy you to raise money for a business where you say, oh yeah, I'm going to have tons of competition. Think about what a monopoly is. A monopoly is an entrepreneur's discovery of a market that has not been taken care of until that time. Most of us, if we're going into business, are looking to achieve a monopoly. Now what happens in a private marketplace? Profits by definition attract competition. By the time Standard Oil was needlessly broken up, Rockefeller had enormous competition not just in the United States, but around the world. By the time Microsoft was muzzled by the Justice Department in the late 90s, Bill Gates had already said, well, the internet's not going to happen, it's going to be a passing fad, and he'd also passed up on the chance to pursue search. Uh, let's think about a few others. Let's think about something like uh, the networks. Uh, Henry brought it up. ABC, CBS, and NBC all turned down Sopranos. HBO got it. One of the most successful shows for HBO in history. Well, so does HBO some, somehow have a vision of the future that others don't? Ah, well, yeah, guess what? They turned down Mad Men. They turned down Breaking Bad. FX has had a lot of successful shows. FX turned down Breaking Bad in favor of Courtney Cox's very memorable TV show, Dirt. Does anyone remember that? Probably not. <laughs> And so the idea that, that you somehow need government to break up monopolies is belied by history. And in terms of how they treat workers, there's this myth out there that Henry Ford raised the wages of his workers because he wanted them to buy his cars. Well, even if he wanted them to do that, that wouldn't have sold the 15 million Model Ts that he did. He did it because it was too expensive for him to underpay his workers. He was experiencing 370% annual turnover. It was costing him a fortune. So what happens in a private economy? Precisely because there's competition for labor talent, Henry Ford had to raise the wages of his workers. Who knows if he loved them? I don't know, but because he wanted to keep them around. It's an economy is not marked by competition that workers are treated the worst. It's the one where there, ones where there is competition, that they have the best chance of living well. So yes, I would much rather leave the government out of this. I don't think there's any evidence that they have a clue about how to manage the real economy. If they did, let's face it, they'd be earning billions in the private sector. Right there. Okay. Also, one last thing. Um, did you say that you think that we that the Welsh of the country should stay, or that the Welsh should stay concentrated so that all could pursue their skills? Yes. How on earth can you? How I, that needs to be explained further. Uh, happy, happy to do it. Let me first of all say that if if you feel you're underpaying for books, I will happily send you one. <laughs> at a very marked up price because I am an author. If, 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 and, if, and you would prefer it, they be sold via yes. Jeff Bezos no. than here at this price? First of all, I could not have written the book that I wrote if Jeff Bezos hadn't created Amazon simply because I learned, I, I have purchased more books that I could never have purchased before thanks to Amazon. It used to be, and I talk about this in the book, she had to write letters over to England and send checks to get certain books. Thank goodness for Jeff Bezos. I couldn't have done it. He's also given me a market. But again, if you feel you're, you're under pain, I will send you one on your own, and, and, and let's work out a much higher price. Um, <laughs> Bill Gates, he wasn't already rich. He got very rich creating something that the market desperately needed. Now, if you want to knock those who are rich, those who maybe inherit or who, who got rich, 
I kind of like them. I think they're venture buyers. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Well, okay, but oh, so those who inherited, they had the temerity to inherit. So you haven't inherited. You're sitting in the library that is a monument to wealth creation. I assume you went to college. Did did did, did some did some very well, but also the, these colleges that people go to. You look at most of the buildings, they have someone's names on it. We're all standing on the so shoulders of giants. We've all inherited enormous amounts by virtue, virtue of living in the United States. You want to talk about a negative inheritance, live in another place. But wait, let, let's, let's finish. In terms, of, um, in terms of wealth concentration, my point is very simple. If even Paris Hilton gets $100 million and acts like a complete fool. I'm not defending her lifestyle, but it's also none of my business. I'm a libertarian. If she wants to live that way, that's her choice. If she puts it in the bank, they're not staring at her dollars lovingly. They are immediately lending them out to others who don't, aren't as rich as she is, to people like me. If she puts it in the stock market, the same idea. So when wealth is concentrated, particularly among the very rich, they can't spend it all. For me, I have to live more paycheck to paycheck. So my wealth is not going to someone else to create a new business. It's the rich precisely because they have so much of it that their wealth goes to the creation of new... Okay, well, I'm dying to know... Wait, 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 no, no, you got to talk. I'm dying to know how you would... How you think entrepreneurs get to animate their vision? Is there some fairy in the sky that somehow drops the money down? No, it's people who have money that, that, that get it to them. After that, personally for me, Look, I'm a libertarian, and, and I have not gotten my way in the world in which we live in. I think taxes should be local. You obviously like higher taxes than I do. Nothing wrong with that. The founders agreed with you. They said the federal government will do very few things, and then people will choose your, their bliss. Some will live in states that offer up enormous amounts of services. And I welcome you. I say you should go to a place like that and give away a lot of your income to, to, to those politicians. For me, I don't want that. I don't trust politicians. I'm a skeptic about politicians, Republican or Democrat. I don't think they're good at, at handling my wealth. And so I would move to a place that would, that would tax less of it. You would have your bliss. You would have, I'm sorry, yeah. You would have your bliss. I would have mine. I'm just saying the federal government is, isn't what should be collecting the taxes. In the back, yeah. Oh, in the white shirt in the back. Yeah. Here's the deal. Let's uh, change subject slightly. Okay? I'm going to give you $100,000. You must invest it now. What would you invest it in? And you can split it up in portions like 10% or whatever. You've got to invest it. Understanding what the world economy is, what the U.S. economy is, understanding your libertarian <coughs> nature, what would you do with $100,000? Right. Well, if, if, if I knew, um, I now, would. Oh, if I had a hundred, I'm sorry. If I had a hundred thousand um, dollars, what would I invest it in right now? I, I suppose if I knew, I'd, I'd, I'd be uh, I'd be one of those one percenters and being vilified by some in the room. But um, I guess what my answer to that would be, in light of the fact that we have a much stronger dollar relative to 2011, in light of the fact that the electorate, in its infinite wisdom, has voted for gridlock in Washington, I would, and in light of the fact that again, I'm a libertarian, I despise all these overseas wars, that we're pulling back from a lot of these overseas commitments, fingers crossed, I would want to be invested in technology because it's during periods of good money and limited government in a relative sense that technology bets do the best. Well, so that- To summarize then, uh, you take the whole $100,000 and invest in U.S. small cap tech stocks, yes? Yes, no? yes I would, I'd invest it in small cap tech stocks. My wealth would be immediately redistributed to entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, the glass is right there. Well, uh, the, the, okay, so the question was if I had $100 million and I would invest it in the way I would invest it, whatever that is, or wouldn't it be better if I, why not just give 
everyone in the room a million dollars. Um, I don't know. I generally would be a pretty unhappy person if I were living on someone else, off someone else. I defy anyone to say that happiness comes from taking from someone else, and, and I find it odd. Most of us would be morally opposed to the idea of someone walking up after me. I think I've got $200 in my pocket. Come, someone walking up to me on the streets of Kansas City and pulling a gun on me and saying, hand it over my money. But somehow you're fully accepting of the idea that politicians can by force, because let's face it, they have force, can come and take that money from me. I personally find it odd enough, and, and I think it's anti-life, anti-humanity, but if you want to look at it in terms of... Uh, I'm actually thinking about as far as how it affects the economy. Well, it, how it affects the economy, I think you can make the same argument that I've been making. Everyone with a million dollars, I know that I have needs. I could spend a lot of that on an annual basis. But with a hundred million dollars, let's face it, I can't consume the vast majority of it. And so as a result, my wealth is once again going to be redistributed through banking, through investments, through private equity, through, through venture capital, to a lot of other interesting ideas. And so the economic impact would be greatly reduced if it were taken out of my hands. Right. No, 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 no. So, so would you. So would anyone use it differently. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, I, I think Forbes is a wonderful magazine, and I agree with everything you said. Did you hear that? He said that Forbes is a wonderful magazine, and I agree with everything that you say. Uh, two more. Okay. Uh, right here in the Kansas. Okay. Um, how do you feel about speculative bubbles? I don't believe, I don't think they're there's such thing. There's because, I mean, there have been for the past, like, every decade or so, there have been these specular bubbles, like with Beanie Babies, comic books, housing, and now with technology and student loans, eventually those bubbles will burst and impact will be detrimental. Well, I, the first thing I would say is I don't buy the speculative bubble argument. There's always a buyer and seller. Implicit in the, the notion of a bubble is that there's just buyers and no one's selling. For me to, per, to speculate on technology or Beanie Babies about their prices going up, someone's got to think that the prices are going down. So that's the first thing. Um, a lot of these bubbles that you're describing are a function of bad monetary policy. In 1971, President Nixon made the disastrous decision of delinking the dollar from gold. And so there weren't oil shocks. In fact, there were commodity shocks across the board because the dollar was weaker. We saw that again. George W. Bush, in his infinite unwisdom, reversed the policies of Reagan and Clinton of maintaining the stable dollar, let it weaken, and commodities soared. So I think that's a lot of what you're describing. In a more broad sense, speculative bubbles. Look, in, in the early 1900s, Detroit was on fire with car makers. It was the Silicon Valley of its time. 2,000 car makers came about, most of them died. Was Detroit impoverished? No, that led to a huge surge of information that enriched not just Detroit, but the world. Silicon Valley, the vast majority of its startups fail. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. It's through pursuit of knowledge and ideas that we get information that transforms the world. You want more of that, not less of it, and that's what Mm -hmm. And basically what you do is you offer, you know, prizes for someone who donates X amount of dollars, you will give it either like a share of your company or so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Other ways to, yeah, Kickstarter, some of these new ways to finance things, it's a wonderful thing. I want more of it, and that's what, that's what my book is about. It's about the leap, removing these government barriers so we can pursue more things. You have to ask, with all this government spending and taxation and unstable money, all the cancer cures we've lost, all the innovations that would make the internet seem dated by comparison, make the planes we fly in see dated by comparison. You in the hat? Um, I've been watching this incredible expansion of uh, both private and, uh, and government, or government debt over the, the last 15 years. Uh, what's your take on uh, this, this massive debt overhang? Can it ever be liquidated? Uh, Mm -hmm. What's your take on 
Well, um, the question was this, this massive increase in federal debt over the years, what's my take on it? It may surprise you, and I have a chapter on this in the book, uh, deficits to me don't matter, and let me explain. To me, all government spending is deficit spending, going back to my point that governments have no resources, and, and someone can try to debate me on that, but the simple truth, government can only spend what it's taxed or borrowed from us first. And so to me, it's all deficit. To, what concerns me is the level of government spending overall. If you gave me a choice between annual deficits of $1 trillion and $1.1 trillion in spending versus a balanced budget of $3.5 trillion, I'll take those deficits any day of the week because that signals a greatly reduced size of the federal government, which means more of our resources are staying in the private sector funding truly innovative ideas. And so deficits don't worry me. Look, rich countries tend to run deficits. Zimbabwe runs surpluses. Rich countries like the U.S., anyone can run, you know, people want to buy our debt because we're, look, they can tax the most productive people on earth. So deficits have never worried me. What if we default? I always hear, oh gosh, what's that going to be? That's going to be so awful, or what are we going to do? Wait, so you're telling me a scenario whereby investors would say it's going to cost you more to borrow money. That's somehow bad for the economy. Well, let's think about that in terms of California. California is thought to be in danger of default for the longest time. If California defaults, does anyone want to say that Apple, the most valuable company on earth, couldn't still raise debt easily? Oh, of course it could. So... Federal government? I'm dying for a scenario whereby we can starve it of more revenues so that it's more difficult to pay it off because I want them to spend less because if government's consuming less, the real economy, the resources that we create, more of them will stay in the real economy and that's going to make all of us better off. I don't care what your ideology is, you can't get around the simple truth that John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi do not allocate capital as well as the private sector does. You're not going to win that argument because you're asking those who have no market discipline to invest better than the best investors on earth. It's not, so deficits, I don't care. It's the spending that scares me to death. For sale, John Lee copies. We'll see you next time. I'm gonna charge you a dollar.